Thank you very much for the invitation of the Brain Foundation to present our work on immune dysfunction. Uh, as you uh, said, uh, my name is Marion Le Boyer. I'm a professor of psychiatry in the University of Paris, head of a very large department in psych psychiatry and CEO of a private foundation called Fondation Fondamentale which is dedicated to research in psychiatry. So as you uh, very well mentioned, after years of uh, interest uh, in the working on the genetic of autism, on brain imaging, I turned to the study of immune dysfunction in autism because I really think that there is much hope there as we already heard uh, this morning, uh, that we're going to better understand autism and uh, uh, improve our diagnostic tools and treatments. So it's been very well explained that uh, today inflammation is, in autism is probably explained by gene and environment interaction. Uh, environmental risk factors have already been described, maternal infections, maternal autoimmune disorders, probably maternal obesity and pollutants, and all of these risk factors probably interact with different genetic risk factors, uh, and in particular HLA and MHC that Lisa Boulanger described extremely well, and I'm going to describe in the field of autism, but also complement gene and interleukin gene. And this inflammation uh, has impact on the periphery, in the brain, and in the gut. So in France, we have created uh, networks of expert centers for uh, patients with autism. And once this workup have been done, uh, they are included in different research projects. And uh, of course, uh, you mentioned the work we have done in genetic, in pharmacogenetic. We've done several clinical trials, healthcare cost study, epidemiology, cognition, brain imaging. And today I'm going to talk about immunology. So the the uh, description I want to give today and discuss, discuss with you is, can we describe triggers and in particular HLA and MHC haplotypes as well as abnormalities uh, of NK cells and targets of the uh, in inflammation in uh, patients with autism. So if we turn to possible triggers of this inflammation that's been amply described this morning, uh, we can describe three types of factors maternal infections, for example, immunogenetic risk factors, and NK cell abnormalities. So it's been very well described in several uh, maternal immune models uh, that there is a successive HIT model in animals, which is associated with abnormal immunoinflammation and can lead to autism. Uh, prenatal stresses, such as in uterine infection, can lead to uh, fetal neuroinflammation, which in turn can induce priming of microglia and astrocyte abnormalities, as well as in parallel to altered neurodevelopmental trajectories. And what is interesting is that possibly these different steps can be one day treated with immunomodulatory interventions. So infections uh, in the pregnant mothers has been described in several uh, previous uh, pandemic. For example, in 1964, uh, the rubella pandemic was associated to increased incidence of autism. And then several European registers has also, have also documented increase of uh, autism born to mothers with infections. And there were several cases studies reporting that type of association. What interests us was to try to understand if the immunogenetic diversity could explain uh, that interaction between environmental risk factors and immunogenetic background could establish susceptible as well as protective patterns of neurodevelopment uh, leading to possibly uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So there are several types of uh, immunogenetic background, innate immunity, which happened very early after the infection. And after then there is the cytokine reaction and then the adaptive immunity, which is governed by HLA MHC system. So we were interested after this publication in the Lancet to focus on uh, HLA MHC system. You see that in this meta-analysis of GWAS, there was a peak on the short arm of chromosome six, which contains the MHC system. Uh, and HLA system, which is uh, included in the MHC system, is a very important system which governs inflammation, infection, and autoimmunity. 
So this HLA system is probably one of the most complex system uh, in the genome. It's located in the short arm of chromosome six. It contains a very large number of genes and alleles. And uh, it's described in different type of classes, class one, two, and three, which all have different, different action in terms of inflammation, anti-infectious responses, and autoimmune disorders. It's been extremely well described that it is probably this region which is the most associated with autoimmune disorders and susceptibility to infection. Uh, and you see here the top hit associated HLA disorder, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, schizophrenia, and psoriasis. So the, the problem with uh, this very complex system is that candidate gene approach or the classical GWAS approach are not very uh, efficient to identify the risk factors. And so we studied uh, ancestral haplotype, which are known to be associated with specific functional properties for, of HLA and probably differentially associated with disorders. And we focus on two such ancestral haplotype, the 571 ancestral haplotype known to be pro-inflammatory and associated with multiple sclerosis and the 8.1 AH, which is pro-inflammatory and associated to anti-infectious response and autoimmunity. And this is one of the results we have obtained uh, in a study performed in the cohort where we previously found the gene encoding uh, neural ligand and Shank3 gene. And we'd analyzed the distribution of the HLA haplotypes and found two types of association, one which is more frequent uh, in patients than controls. And it's associated with an ancestral haplotype which is very known to be very pro-inflammatory and uh, associated with different disorders of interest uh, in autism, in particular uh, the celiac disease. And we also found that there was a protection uh, association being found less frequently in patients, which is the 8.1 AH haplotype, which is characterized by the absence of complement C4 locus and I don't have time to explain this, but this very well matches what uh, Lisa has just described in terms of possibly abnormal pruning associated with this haplotype. We've also studied uh, HLA association with a subgroup of autism called regressive autism, where a normal development occurs and is then followed by a previous loss of uh, previously acquired normally developing language and social skills. And regressive autism is thought to be a biologically distinct form of autism with several immune dysfunctions, such as very elevated levels of circulating cytokines, B cell activation, and also presence of autoantibodies against fetal brain uh, and proven enteropathy. So in collaboration with Christopher Gilberg in Sweden, uh, we perform full HLA genotype of patients with or without regressive autism and found a protective effect against regressive autism of another ancestral haplotype called HLA-DPA1, which belongs to the HLA-62.1. And this is probably a new way to understand what's uh, underlying a regressive autism. We then studied the ANK cells uh, also, thinking that maybe that would also help us to understand pathophysiology of autism. As you all know, NK cells are central elements of the innate immune surveillance system. They are uh, five to 20% of circulating lymphocytes. They are inhibited by CMH1 molecules and they are activated by stress-induced ligands. Uh, there are two types of NK cells, the NK immunoregulatory cells, which are associated with elevated production of cytokines, and NK cells, which are cytotoxic cells. And we performed a study, uh, which we are in the process of replicating, where we shown in a population of uh, adult patients with high functioning autism. And we found that in these patients, uh, the natural killer lymphocyte cells are activated at basal level. Uh, and while they're activated, they also express less cytotoxicity, which means that they are functionally exhausted. And they also highly express a marker which normally is found in uh, 
in, in, in patients with infection. And this viral infection has not been found uh, in patients with autism, which means that we need to search why there is this highly expressed marker, which is called NKG2C. So in, in conclusion of this uh, study, what we have found is that there is a progressive exhaustion of NK cell function, which are over the time less cytotoxic, which probably explain persistence of infection and persistence of abnormalities of, of NK cells. Uh, so if we turn now to trying to describe what co possibly could be considered as targets of this inflammation, which is associated with hypothetically abnormal immunogenetic factors as well as abnormal NK cells. I'm just going to briefly describe the presence of autoantibodies in autism, which can be linked to this inflammation, as well as the gut-brain axis in autism. So first, uh, the interaction between uh, these environmental risk factors and immunogenetic background probably leads to the persistence low-grade inf inflammation in autism. And we know that inflammation can induce a presence of brain autoantibodies as well as abnormality of the gut. So we have obtained a different type of preliminary results, again, in a population of patients with uh, adults uh, who have autism spectrum disorder without mental retardation. And we've, we tested systematically peripheral autoantibodies as well as brain autoantibodies and found that presence of autoantibodies were found in 60% of adults with autism spectrum disorder without mental retardation. Uh, and this is uh, remains to be uh, fur fur further explored, but it is uh, impressive when compared to the uh, autoimmunity in the general population, which is call, close to 15%. I also want to mention that we have uh, worked a lot of auto, uh, on autoantibodies against NMDA receptor, in particular with Laurent Groc, who is a specialist on, on molecular neuroimaging techniques. And we have systematically searched for uh, auto, presence of these autoantibodies in the serum of patients with autism and found in several patients the presence of these autoantibodies. So we try to find out if there is a functional impact of the presence of the autoantibody on the synaptic cleft, and found that in contrast to what we described, which is autoimmune psychosis, we didn't find any impact of these autoantibodies found in the serum of patients with autism on the uh, uh, synaptic cleft uh, of glutamatergic function. So this remains to be tested because it means that we need to be cautious when we find autoimmune bodies and we need to find if there is any functional consequences. I uh, also want to say a few words on another consequences of this low-grade inflammation, uh, which is the gut-brain uh, abnormalities. Uh, this we already have heard a lot today. And you know that gut-brain is a major uh, player, probably in autism. And in particular, it's probably uh, explains uh, part of the well-known elevation of uh, serotonin in autism, but also the change in microbiome composition. So once again, very similarly to what is being done in the States and in several countries, we have created a platform to be able to study not only the microbiome, but also to study the clinical picture and in particular presence or absence of gastrointestinal symptoms as well as cytokine profile and metagenomic analysis. And uh, we tried to do translational analysis by after stratification of patients uh, between those with gastro gastrointestinal symptoms and those without. Uh, we tried to perform microbiota transfer in a preclinical model and con continue assessing uh, patients to do uh, biostatistical analysis, trying to find immune signatures of these patients. And we are, uh, we all know, we have heard today that the presence of gastrointestinal symptoms were very frequently present in autism. And what we try to do is to better stratify patients and to try to identify precisely a subgroup of patients with autism having gastrointestinal symptoms and to search if they have a specific clinical and biological profile and the preliminary results we have obtained in collaboration with Leticia Davidovich, who I think you're going to listen to next week, is that they have more autoimmune disorders, more severe social and sensory symptoms using a scale that we have developed, which is called GIPSI. 
Uh, we're also performing these preclinical results that I briefly described in collaboration with Michel Nonist in Nantes. And we found that uh, the intestinal flora of patients with Asperger syndromes having uh, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms have an impact on the intestinal barrier. So we first compared patients with autism to controls and we found that they have a diminished permeability of intestinal barrier, modification of the gene expression in gut and enteric nervous system and elevation of biliary acids exclusively metabolized by gut flora. And we then compared patients with autism with or without gastrointestinal symptoms and found some more precise markers of this subgroup, diminished permeability of the uh, intestinal barrier, as well as increased oxidative stress. This is all ongoing studies. So just to conclude, these are the list of uh, people that made all this research possible, people from my department, where we host an expert center for adult patients with autism, the lab where we do all the cytokine analysis, and this has been done in collaboration with Laurent Groc in Bordeaux, with Jérôme Honora, who is doing autoimmune, uh, autoantibodies analysis, and Nicolas Gleichenhaus, who is doing cytokine analysis. I just want to uh, conclude that uh, by, by saying that we, we seem all over the world to be doing the same type of analysis. And I think that would be great if all the foundations that support our work could help us to collaborate in order to be able to compare the results obtained in different parts of the globe. Thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful talk. Um, it's very interesting that NK cells, I mean, we saw similar sort of things many years ago. So it's always very good, very nice that um, we get, uh, you know, some confirmation, you know, from other labs, like you say, at other places around the world. So um, that was, a, it, all of it was music to my ears. Um, the, I, I'm interested to see, of course, I'd be very interested to see how your GI data works as well. Um, and for the peripheral markers, are you just looking at cytokines or are you going to be looking at a number of things in, in, in the, your current study? Plasma cytokines. So we're, going, we're looking at uh, serum cytokines. We're looking at auto, systematically at autoantibodies, both targeting peripheral markers, but also brain autoantibodies. We're looking at other markers of uh, inflammation and we are systematically doing uh, HLA genotyping haplotype in order to find if there are specific haplotypes associated with subgroups. And of course, there is always a, a question of power when you do so many analyses. So this is why really compare, being able to collaborate and comparing the profile that we found would be, I think, so valuable for the field. I, I think I think you're right. I mean, that is true. I mean, in yeah, we, we didn't find um, many difference in plasma cytokines and so looking at other markers i think would be would be interesting and, and we can if the, if you have findings we can have we can do the same things in in our cohorts as well and try and share that sort of data um so that yeah that's good and of course it'd be interesting to see if you can have a high gi profile and a low gi profile and, and whether that can be <clears throat> transplanted into mice so much as sarcus masmanian did in his previous study. So yeah, I, I find it very fascinating. Um, I haven't seen any questions on the chat. Um, at the call, real quick. <clears throat> so that was a fantastic presentation. And obviously you, you're right in, in, the, in the area that Paul and I love to, to discuss. So, um, and I'm, I'm wondering um, in your, um, Pan how did you choose your panel for your adult study for the um, autism without without ID without intellectual disability? You mean the inclusion the inclusion criteria. You mean no the panel of markers that you chose. Oh, we just yeah. systematically look at the same markers that I think everybody is looking at, which are markers of inflammation or to antibodies and relevant genes or haplotypes. Yeah, I just yeah I, I was particularly interested in the autoantibodies what the um because we're sort of with at least in the stay with the kids we're sort of well behind where we are in the maternal autoantibody story um but it'd be nice to catch up and to sort of understand and i do love the idea of having a, a sort of a consortium effort on this i think that is 
each of us has brings something to the table, but we also have so many things in common that it would be an amazing, um, I think, event even just to bring us all, well, maybe virtually right now, but all together, you know, to discuss what um, our approaches can be and how we can potentially um, create kind of like Paul said, sort of a, a set of criteria and things that we look at so that we, we get increased numbers, we get sort of, so we aren't doing these small little foci and then publishing independently on them. I'm very happy that you have the same vision or idea. I think we are not that many people around the globe working on that area. And each of us try to gather as many data as we can. But if we can just see if we find the same thing using the same methods, of course, and try to mm -hmm. replicate. Uh, but not only that, it's the, the negative data that we have or yes. the, or, or <laughs> the stuff that doesn't you, work. <laughs> you, know, don't, you know, so it could inform you which ones are the better. Anyway, I, ha I do have some questions from, um, from the audience. Um, one question, which is, is interesting, but I don't know. Um, it's, it's a hard one, but um, so the question is, what kind of immunomodulatory treatments have you found helpful in cl clinical treatments for different subgroups? So we have not done uh, any, any clinical trials so far. Uh, it's extremely difficult in France to perform clinical trial. And unless we find specific subgroups with specific pathophysiology, I don't think it's fair to try that. So we are on the process of starting uh, a probiotic study uh, because we have some very interesting preclinical data uh, and this could, I think, help patients. But apart from that, in France, we have not done anything in the field of immunomodulatory treatment, at least. Mm. 